All right. Well, thank you very much. And um, it's always uh, fun to talk about um, what we do um, here in Silicon Valley regarding solar energy. And um, I hope you will find some of our uh, lessons interesting. Uh, so first of all, why are we talking about solar? Um, it, the, the last um, half decade to a decade has been really an amazing story for solar energy. And if you just look at the growth in the industry compared to some of the conventional sources of power, you'll see that there is overall 15 gigawatts of new capacity that's been installed over the last year versus three gigawatts of new nuclear power. So when you think about what energy source um, is growing in capacity, clearly the renewable energies have been growing a lot faster than conventional power, particular some kinds of conventional power. So what this has led to, and this is what um, I personally find so exciting about being in this industry, is that um, it is already an $80 billion industry that's going to be going to a trillion dollars in 2013. Um, this kind of a growth rate is over the last decade is basically, um, you know, uh, has been experienced in Silicon Valley here, but not in the energy industry. And so um, I, I have, um, you know, had the good fortune of getting involved um, around the 2006 time frame. And so that tremendous growth curve was something that, um, uh, you know, experiencing has been a, a great experience. And I would hope that everybody gets a chance to be part of such growth no matter what the industry is. One of the reasons for the growth is because if you look at the price of um, solar modules, it has dropped dramatically as well. And we'll talk a lot about, um, about modules and production and uh, many of the topics that uh, you guys had submitted questions on during the course of the discussion. Um, you are welcome to interrupt me with questions if you'd like, um, and I will try, if I haven't covered your questions during the discussion, during the talk, I'll try to make sure to save some time at the end to talk about them specifically. So before I get going on the actual presentation, I thought I'd just spend a few, minute, few moments on um, who I am. Um, and uh, Leslie gave an introduction, um, and, but let me just kind of uh, substantiate that a little bit more. Um, I do, I did start off at the other place across the bay. Um, I was actually born and raised in Berkeley as well. My dad's a professor there, my husband's a professor here, so we are house divided. Um, but uh, when, I, when I graduated and I was fortunate enough to work in an area like nanotechnology, which was also a very growing um, uh, industry at the time, I chose to not continue academia, but go into industry. And that bifurcation, you know, as you find, you're going to have these critical decisions at various points in your life. And so that bifurcation was in, um, an important one. Um, as I mentioned, my dad is in academia, and he said postdocs um, are, you know, done, but they're not really a great use of your time, um, is what he had guided me to. And so he um, encouraged me to explore industry when I looked at options. Because the natural thing to do after grad school is just to go on, get a postdoc, and try to be a professor somewhere. Um, but, um, but I had kind of inclinations of business anyway. And so um, I went and found a, um, a position at Applied Materials. Applied is a very um, customer-focused uh, company. So I went from the world of research and kind of big picture thinking to you know, having a paycheck that says, this is paid for by happy customers. So it was pretty dramatic. Um, fortunately for me, my husband was at Stanford during the time, and so I could always escape away. We were living in married student housing in, um, you know, here on campus. I could always escape away to academia when I needed to. But, um, but as I look back, those, those three years I spent at Applied were very um, foundational for understanding the industry. And in that case, it was a semiconductor equipment industry. Um, but having had um, a taste of that, um, I moved on to... Um, to Agent Labs, where um, I had the pleasure of meeting Leslie and worked more in the R&D environment. So I kind of, I think I went extreme into industry and then stepped back a little bit more in um, towards R&D. And there, um, I was fortunate to work on a project that's related to the printed circuit board assembly industry. So I was able to both change positions as well as change industries. Um, and then I had the opportunity to do my do my startup. Um, Nanotubes, in the meanwhile, had become very exciting. Um, there were a bunch of different startups that had, start, that had um, been founded by 
professors that were pursuing nanotech as a application in the startup area, and so a lot of venture funding was going towards that. Um, I looked at what those applications were, but now having spent a fair amount of time in industry, I realized that I think these are really far-fetched and it's, it's going to be hard to productize. So I came up with a business plan and idea to use carbon nanotubes for electronics cooling, and, um, and I felt that that was a lower risk technology um, compared to the others. Um, and uh, it was a great experience, um, and you know, I think one of the, the things that are special about Silicon Valley and the reason we pay such high prices uh, for our living is that we've got this sand hill um, and the, the venture industry here is actually quite supportive. So it took no effort to, um, to, you know, uh, to start uh, digging into what it would take to write a business plan. There's a whole um, network of um, both social and academics and uh, business people who are always willing to help. And so I had the good fortune of receiving $5 million of um, top tier VC money. And um, I went ahead and pursued my idea, um, hired uh, top people that, had, that I'd come across in, um, in my other companies. And, um, and we actually took the technology to where as far as we could go. And then I, um, as a founder and CEO of the company, decided that I would, um, since we had taken it to where we could, but the market had changed, Instead of continuing on and um, and you know spending more of the VC funding that I'd raised, we'd only spent about half of it, and I actually um, you know told the board that we can't pursue the same market that we were planning on, so we can either change markets or we can shut down. And I gave them back their money. They gave me back my patents. We had um, you know the, not the exact outcome that we had hoped to for in the beginning, but it's a high risk industry. It's uh, and so people expect these type of ends as well. Um, overall though, I would recommend it to people if they have um, a passion for something because it's a great way to be able to pursue what you would like to do. Uh, and then it was an opportunity to think, okay, as a technologist, you know, you can solve a lot of problems, but what are problems that people really care about? And so solar had become quite, you know, had developed um, substantially in the past year since I'd left grad school. And so I had the opportunity to um, have actually TJ Rogers on my technical advisory board for my startup. And so through him, um, I got to know SunPower. And um, when I entered, SunPower was 400 people. By the time I left, three years later, it was 4,000 people. So it was that experience of growth that, um, that was, was great. And, um, and then I had the opportunity to join a startup. And I felt, again, as a technologist, it's really nice to pursue um, a, a technology, and I'll tell you about that um, in the coming slides. Okay, so um, as you see from my background, I've got technology, I've got um, startup, I've got business, so this presentation is going to cover all of those. We'll start with technology. Uh, solar panel is about a square meter. Depending on the efficiency, it can give you 100 to 200 watts. It's not that much more than a light bulb, but a lot bigger. Um, and um, so from an energy generation perspective, um, it's a it's pretty simple device, um, especially when you compare it to a lot of the complicated semiconductor um, devices that are produced here in Silicon Valley. Um, basically, light comes in, creates an electron hole pair. You've got um, electrodes on either side that capture it, and you generate um, power. Now, the issue really is that, um, that um, much of the power that you so, so, so what you do for processing is um, you try to enhance as much of the power that, um, that, uh, that, that um, was received by your device translates into electrical power. And, um, and you do that by you know, various techniques of texturing. And, um, and when you look at the loss mechanisms, unfortunately, the, much of the energy does not um, convert to electrical power. And, um, and so solar cell design and manufacturing, it's all about reducing loss. You can't really optimize, um, you know, you, you, so, so it's kind of, a, it's, it's, it, you know, you, you will never get 100%. So you start off with, in silicon, it's about 30% is the best you can do. And, um, and you basically just start fighting or working with physics to reduce your overall losses. Um, some of the types of losses are that you, the electron hole pairs recombine before they get a chance to get to the electrodes. 
Um, so the quality of the material that you start off with is very important. Um, another is the um, type of texturing that you have so that you can try to have multiple reflections and, and keep the light inside the um, semiconducting material as, much, as long as you can. That is um, another place where there's uh, quite a bit of um, loss. So overall, your standard cell design at this point is about 18% um, efficient. And, um, and you know, it sounds very uh, marginal, but in the, in the silicon world, um, this, this number started off at around 12%. And so the industry has made substantial progress, but now they're really kind of at the, um, at a tougher point um, in, in, from a technology perspective for road mapping and trying to get more and more efficiency. The highest efficiency to date for silicon is actually SunPower and um, the design came out of Stanford here. Um, Dick Swanson, the founder of SunPower, um, was a professor before he left and founded um, his company. And um, he's a, you know, a dedicated um, solar enthusiast and, he worked on many, many projects um, until he was able to really turn this technology into a mass production industrial scale. Um, and there's some special things that, that SunPower does. I mean, it gets the cell efficiency, efficiency to be as high as 22%. Um, the cost has really been a key. So overall, the, you know, the, the device itself is not that complicated. Um, and what has been a, um, a challenge for the industry has been really cost reduction. And um, I've kind of given an um, idea of where the cost is, and this is predominantly for silicon, of course. So a lot of it is actually in the installation itself. And, um, and over the years, this, is, this has um, been reduced substantially. People have gotten better at, um, uh, you know, be, designing a package for solar that can be installed by people who are not don't need to be so specially trained to do um, electrical installations. Um, and then, of course, a lot of the materials that were used, the racking, et cetera, you know, smart, simple, simple things, actually, have made a tremendous um, impact in the industry. Um, the overall panel itself, um, I'm starting from the, the, I guess, right, left side, right side there. Um, the solar panel itself, um, glass is expensive. The, um, uh, the junction box, all of those things that you really, you absolutely have to have, they, um, you know, they've gotten, uh, they've reduced as the volume has increased, um, but, um, but that is still a substantial overall cost for a solar system. And then the cell, this is where there's a lot of design features like we just reviewed. And if you look at the overall equation for trying to reduce the cost of solar, um, if you can increase the power that's generated, then that's highly beneficial because you've got a you know, bigger number in the denominator to divide everything um, with. So efficiency is a huge lever. And, um, and you know, as long as you can get efficiency but not increase the cost of the production, you're really going to be in a better position. And, um, and people, you know, continuously, all the standard cell manufacturers also, they work very hard to increase efficiency even like tenth of a percent um, because it's such a big lever on the entire value proposition. And then there's the starting material itself. This um, is silicon, um, and, and you'll see in a minute why um, silicon is is uh, the dominant uh, material in the solar industry right now. Um, and I, if for those of you who maybe have followed the industry um, for the last couple of years, there was a time where um, the silicon used for solar, um, the prices became very high because there was so much more demand. And the, solar, the silicon producers never expected solar to grow so quickly. So now the solar industry uses much more um, silicon than the semiconductor industry does. But before that, obviously, 
you know, that was the other way around. And so they, ne they didn't anticipate this production, or they didn't anticipate this, um, this big surge in growth, and so they didn't have the production capacity. Um, and so they could get away with like ridiculous prices. So there's a little place where the module price actually goes up because silicon became really expensive. Um, but then a lot of capacity came online, and so now those prices have um, dropped substantially, which has enabled the solar panel end cost to drop substantially. Okay, so um, the if you kind of do a, an overview of technology, they it falls into two big chunks: crystalline and thin film. Um, crystalline there is divided into um, silicon, which can be both monocrystalline and multicrystalline. And then also I want to make sure to um, to include gallium arsenide, even though it's a very 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 small um, amount in the market overall. Um, it's it's important um, and it's used predominantly in satellites and um, uh, you know ex extraterrestrial applications for solar. Thin film, um, amorphous silicon is one of the um, uh, one of the technologies there. It can be deposited on a glass plate, which is rigid, but it can also be deposited on flexible materials, which turns out to be um, you know uh, a unique way of deploying um, solar. And then SIGs, uh, you hear a lot about SIGs, particularly in the Valley. We have had dozens of solar startups that are focused on SIGs technology. Um, one of the SIGs technologists actually uh, mentioned to me that uh, the, the, the challenge in getting any of, these any of these companies across the line has been that there's so many ways that you can deposit SIGs. You can plate it, you can co-evaporate it, you can sputter it, do all these different. And so there was a lot of effort put on all of them rather than effort put on, you know, a consolidated effort put on any one technique to get this technology across the finish line. So, um, but there's still work being done on it, and it works. You know, this is the uh, exciting thing about solar is that, m and, you know, you have a semiconducting material, you shine light on it, you have a, an appropriate, you know, design, you will get power. It's just the efficiency of it and, um, and the cost of it that matter. And then Catel, um, First Solar is the main, um, you know, uh, manufacturer of this material, and uh, they have done a fantastic job in um, developing it, um, the tech, de developing the technology for it, which took over a decade, and then um, a um, and deploying it in the marketplace. Um, very strong manufacturing team um, that goes along with this technology that's led to its success. And then also, um, this is where my current company, Alta Devices, comes into play. Gallium arsenide is, um, is as I mentioned, another um, solar uh, material. Um, but what we've done is actually taken this, um, this high efficiency semiconductor and, um, and designed a process by which it can be both a crystal and a thin film. So I'll pass around some samples. Um, Perfect. And then Dom, you can see from a market perspective, if you look on roofs around the world, you'll see a lot more of the crystalline than you will of the thin film. Okay, um, speaking of roofs, uh, the main area for application has been uh, rooftops uh, for residential applications, which we call distributed generation, um, power plants, um, which it actually was one of the reasons for the boom in the industry and where you, where people, um, the, the incentives that governments put in place to, to, um, to establish um, and develop power plants is what caused this big boom in the industry. And, uh, and then commercial buildings as well where you've got large um, air, flat areas where you can deploy um, solar modules. And then... Um, I uh, would like to add to this application um, picture the, uh, what we like to talk about as portable. And as I mentioned, some of the thin film technologies can be deposited on flexible substrates. So um, more recently, it's a niche market at this point, but, um, but it's an emerging market of portable solar. So what I'd like to do now is kind of segue, and I have uh, a quite a few slides that talk about Alta Devices, which is where I work right now. And in fact, let me, um, while I'm talking, I can pass around some of the samples. Um, we're a true Silicon Valley startup. Um, and the, uh, 
the technology has come out of here we go can, has come out of um, Caltech and UC Berkeley, and um, we have a Silicon Valley team that has spent the last five six years developing this technology. And um, what we're trying to do is basically um, cut the cord. So we kind of think about power as something that comes from a wall that has to be translated through um, wires. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could change that um, paradigm? And what it takes, in our view, to change that is um, you need to have a high efficiency. You need to have flexibility. You need to have light weight. And, um, and with that, you can potentially um, make this type of uh, mobile uh, power revolution occur. So for towards that end, we um, have developed a cell design that um, is the world record, actually, 28.8%. Um, and um, in, for single junction, we, um, for our dual junction is 30.8. And our overall module um, that would that is 24.1%. Uh, All of these have been validated by NREL in Colorado, the National Renewable um, Energy Lab. And, um, and we can certainly break our module record. Um, we used a, you know, just some standard cells. Um, but, um, but our focus right now is actually to commercialize the technology. And so we've um, taken the, the, the development that we did and are now moving into the phase of deployment into um, applications. So, you know, if you think about where you use power, you don't just use power sitting in your house, you actually use power um, on the go. And um, as happens often with many applications um, that are new, um, the, uh, the military um, is um, a early uh, adopter of new technologies. Have um, had the vision and passion to try to contribute to uh, to uh, renewables, and um, and I wanted to kind of take this opportunity to maybe just go through what is the pathway. Yeah, um, they've got it. I think they've got it. Yeah. What is the pathway for a new technology, an idea, an innovation that um, that uh, you know a person or a group of people have? And how does it kind of life cycle its way towards um, commercial scale? So initially, um, it starts off with research, often in a university, um, sometimes in a government um, or an industry um, uh, you know, lab. And then you've got um, an incubation period. Um, we call this kind of the pre-commercial um, gap. Sometimes ideas, if people are not, depending on how well, they're championed. They either get through this gap or not. Um, their um, angel investors play a role. We just, over lunch, had a discussion with somebody who's, who's out there, has a really interesting idea, combining you know, um, energy and gaming. Um, and you know, angel investors here play an important role. The VC industry also, depending on how much money you're raising. So in my case, I was here. And I raised about $5 million because I needed equipment. I mean, this was, this was hardware. This is not just kind of a software idea that I didn't, you know, I would be able to get away with smaller amounts of funding. Um, so so this, is a, th this is where I think, you know, having a champion or somebody who cares deeply about the idea either crosses this valley or a lot of ideas actually just never make it across. They're kind of a concept, but then people get busy with their daily lives or if they're, you know, whatever else they're, they're involved with. And, um, and lose the focus. Uh, then you've got where you establish a pilot line. And this is, um, this is basically what we've been doing for the last um, you know, uh, two years. And, um, and the venture community plays a very important role. Um, industry, and you saw our, the range of investors that we had. So a combination of industry and, um, and VCs um, help this phase you know, substantially. Then what happens is you need a lot more money to, especially if you're a hardware company um, like us and like most of the solar plays that were here in the valley, you need a lot more money to get across so that you can actually enter the market. And then once, you've com once you have got across, there's a lot of money. You know, banks will give you money. The government will give you money. Um, industry will again come in and, and play an um, important role. But getting past here 
is where many of the solar startups have um, have been um, uh, have basically gotten challenged. I know several of you asked the questions. You know, what's been what's led to, you know, some of the um, I guess quote failures um, or um, the 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 full cycle not being realized and. Um, you know, I think many people will have their own um, views on it. Um, for me personally, I feel that the venture industry played, you know, as, as you see in this, the venture, I mean, the, you know, um, uh, the VCs play an important role. Um, and in solar too, they did a, um, uh, they did invest. It's not that the Valley did not actually take clean tech seriously. I mean, you, they, over, you know, uh, the last decade, there's o over six billion dollars um, that have gone into um, clean tech. Um, but recently, you see it's gotten much lower, and the main reason for that is that this money poured in, but the return um, didn't come. And so, from a timeline perspective, the VCs um, have not really been able to. Uh, satisfy their formulas for returns. And so as they look at continuing funding this effort, they see that they're not, it's, a, it's not really fitting the equation that they normally would want to. And the main reason is um, for solar is that um, it takes quite a lot of capital. And so the problem that happened, or you know, the, the timing for a lot of the, the solar startups locally is as they got out of pilot scale, and a lot of them very successfully developed the technology. You know, many of the companies that are listed here did a great job of taking their technology to the lim to to where it could go in a pilot manufacturing scale, and all of them had manufacturing in the Bay Area. So, the um, uh, you know the challenge was really to kind of get over now and do large scale manufacturing. Some chose to do it here in um, in the U.S. Uh, most did not choose to do in California. It had to go outside the state. Um, but, um, but, and then, you know, um, that activity takes quite a lot of capital. Um, there, and, you know, um, uh, and I've kind of put a little comment there as to what the current status is. And unfortunately, we have had some um, publicly, uh, you know, uh, discussed um, failures. And so that's where the industry has gotten a little bit of its um, reputation, that money has gone in and return has not happened. But it's because more money is required for return to occur. So at the same time as you need more money, the capital markets dried up and everybody, you know, just from the overall financial crisis. And then on the other side, the, um, the module prices dropped substantially. So I have a few slides that I'll talk to you about that too. And um, what that dynamic has been like. But so you had a very challenging market, you had very limited capital, and you had technology that hadn't proven itself yet. And so that becomes very, very, you know, difficult um, to survive that situation. And, uh, and unfortunately, many, you know, very good companies with a lot of passion and hard work that went into them um, were, had to be asset sailed. And um, so some are still around, and we're, we're surviving to, um, to you know, either outlast the capital um, uh, drought. Um, and in some cases, people have been gotten acquired by other companies that are willing to put more capital into it to grow. Um, but that's basically, um, you know, the, the current story. What, um, what many of those companies were hoping for was more of the first solar and sun power story. So these are the US companies that um, had been um, started much earlier. Um, like I said, over a decade ago, I think, um, you know, uh, Dick spent about 20 years um, developing the sun power technology until he commercialized it. And, um, and first solar also, uh, over a decade, they, they um, spent developing the technology and um, they were, um, both of these companies were supported by projects as well as, um, you know, um, industry and corporate um, partners. 
So back in um, 2009, um, First Solar was actually the um, top producer of solar panels. So even though thin film is a, is a smaller amount of the overall market, um, they um, have substantial production capacity and they were a um, large producer. Um, SunPower has remained in the top 10, but you know, not the top three. Um, and you take a look at the rest of these names and um, you know, uh, they are uh, mostly Asian. And um, one of the reasons for that, even Canadian Solar, by the way, is an Asian company. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the, um, the uh, Asian governments did support the manufacturing and did, in fact, make the capital much less expensive. So many of these companies were able to establish um, lots of manufacturing capacity at, um, at you know, low prices. So they didn't have to pay as much for equipment because it was supported by the government. That doesn't mean that they didn't work hard as well. I mean, to get the establish the technology, to you know, um, install the equipment, to get a process running on it, to get high yield, to get the supply chain to work. All of that certainly takes its um, that it takes a lot of effort. And um, and you know, in my view, that I think that the Asian governments were a little bit more. Uh, they were more clear in the strategy that they wanted to take towards. Um, renewables and particularly solar in this case and they made a commitment and they they you know <laughs> people were able to easily access that that funding and that money and it led to um to you know the picture that you see here so um but as i mentioned so so what happened is that there became you know hundreds of solar cell manufacturers because as we talked about earlier the device itself is really not that complicated and there was a lot of um uh, innovation that had been done on the equipment side, and it was actually done mostly out of um, Europe um, and um, in, in the U.S., where the equipment platforms became um, such they could generate higher volume at similar price points. And so now, if you had a tool, you could you could easily um, you know pump out 50 megawatts, whereas earlier, a couple of years before, you could only do 25. So so the capital. Um, if, you had the, if you had the money to spend and buy the equipment, you could pretty easily generate solar cells. Um, and there was a you know, ready market for them um, through a lot of the, um, the power plant and the incentives that various countries have put in place. And so there was a ready market. And you know, if, you can, if you put the effort into it, you'll certainly be able to um, make panels. And, um, and with so many players doing that, the prices dropped, which is actually exactly what the solar industry always wanted to have happen. If you talk to people who've been in the industry for a long time, they're always waiting and waiting for solar to be cheap enough, because what we want is for solar to be um, to reach grid parity and be not a decision for you know a, a you know a, a, a emotional or moral decision, but a financial decision to say, hey, I've got an alternative which is just as good. Let me just go with that. Um, so that's always been the drive, and that requires solar to be cheap. So this big flux of, of activity that happened in Asia actually drove those prices cheaper. Um, and um, so today we've got a, a really broad-scale deployment of solar energy, which is actually very exciting to, to see, um, but just challenging to be a part of if you're not a big player. And, you know, this kind of gives you a, uh, another view of that, but... Um, you know, about half the manufacturing is in China and about less than 5% in the U.S. I think this is even like a worse figure as time goes on. Um, however, and, and then, you know, why are these things important? And now we get into more of the, you know, industry aspects of it too. But, you know, if you have a manufacturing job, um, and my last few slides here speak about manufacturing since that's kind of what's on our mind um, of late. Uh, if you have a manufacturing job in your area, you will $1 that is um, goes towards manufacturing actually returns um, you know one point four dollars in the overall sector because you you know your supply chain and, and you know labor and all of those other things that go along with it are enhanced considerably whereas the same thing in you know other areas like retail it doesn't generate as much um, uh, overall 
economic growth, um, as does uh, manufacturing. And so this is also kind of a um, consistent with what many of us have experienced over the last few decades as manufacturing has reduced in the U.S. and increased in other parts of the world. Um, there was a question on the solar uh, supply chain and, um, and where that's at. Um, so I wanted to include a slide um, uh, about that. So this is the overall from equipment down to production. And if you see here, there's a lot of U.S. companies that, um, that have an important role to play. Um, and th I, I've taken some of this material from um, a, a talk I gave at Intersolar, which compared U.S. and China manufacturing. Um, so it's focused more on U.S. rather than just um, Europe. But you'll see most of the equipment suppliers are actually um, European um, and, um, and American. You have very few um, Asian, some but few um, equipment manufacturers. Materials, um, you know, DuPont and these guys, uh, and, then the, and the, definitely the silicon guys, they had a, they've um, had a, um, a very substantial growth in their um, businesses that have supplied materials to the PV industry. And so, you know, it doesn't matter where that growth is happening, these guys are the uh, preferred suppliers. Um, they will benefit, and they, they did. And they have. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, um, there's, uh, there's few of us. Um, and if you look at where the substantial growth in manufacturing capacity has been, um, First Solar has actually expanded in Asia. And most of these other companies um, will as well, most likely. So um, I know. Probably manufacturing is not on your mind so much, but as a as you kind of look at the future and you kind of see what different roles um, R and D um, and uh, plays and how it feeds back into this uh, support cycle of making goods. Now I'm not talking about software, but we're talking about hardware where you're actually producing, um, you know, uh, sellable goods. Uh, the cornerstones, in my view, and certainly we see this in the um, solar industry, is equipment, R&D, and supply chain. Um, and all those lead to, um, you know, uh, a high uh, productivity and um, excellence in manufacturing. But it's a feedback cycle. So the more you learn about what is working in manufacturing, the more you can adjust your equipment, the better you can spec the materials that you're using, right? So there's actually a information cycle in here that if you break this you and you know you only do this you actually are going to not be able to take advantage of the learning that happens and the people who are doing this will start doing this and they will learn uh, more and more about what needs to be done and so it's really important to kind of um, see this picture and um, and um, make sure where your value is and, um, and you know, ideally have it such that there's an enhancement to, um, to the entire feedback cycle, um, the full feedback cycle. And I just took this uh, cartoon from, apparently there was a very famous uh, meeting that happened between Obama and, um, and Steve Jobs and, you know, the question was, can we get some of these jobs back? And the answer was no. Once, they're, once they leave, it's really hard to get them back. And it's basically, in my view, because of this. Because once you break this cycle, um, you're, it's, it's hard to recreate it. So we have to be opportunistic about what we do. Um, my last two slides here. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the valley that come and go. There's a lot of technologies, um, nanotubes actually are around, but you know, the level of impact that they had um, isn't what we expected it to be. Um, there's a lot of things that become popular and then less popular, et cetera. Um, and my view, um, solar is not a fad. Um, it did go through and it is going through its, you know, swings and cycles. Um, but Overall, energy is a huge need and demand, and solar is a technology that fits that demand. And um, as time goes on, 
Um, there's various different capacities in which it's used, so on rooftops, as I mentioned, in, um, in power plants. We haven't even, you know, the portable doesn't even make this list yet because it's such an emerging market. But if you, you know, with a little bit of imagination, I think we can imagine, we can see that that will also add considerably to, um, to society, hopefully favorably. And um, overall, solar is still a very, very small fraction of what the overall energy mix is in the U.S. But, um, but I think most of us believe and hope and desire it to be a larger fraction as time goes on. Okay, thank you. How do you see organic solar cells as a competitor? Yeah, so organic solar cells, um, there's, uh, there's a fair amount of work being done on them in universities. And um, I guess the, um, and they, they also have the benefit of being flexible. Um, and the idea is that they can be very cheap because it's very cheap materials that you start off with. Um, I think the thing to watch out for when you um, are looking to develop that and deploy it into um, industry is that many of the other things you have to do are still similar cost. So you have to still put metal on it. That metal is going to cost you the same as if you were to put it onto silicon or on gallium arsenide. You still have to encapsulate it in glass likely or put some sort of a hermetic sealing on it if it's flexible or rigid. That's going to cost you the same. So the key is going to be the efficiency. And so if you can, and I know that's what people are kind of working on, but where you start off from is, is pretty low right now, right? Single digit efficiencies. So if those, and I know that there's predictions people have that it can also be 40%. So if you can get beyond, I mean, at least reach, you know, double digit efficiencies, um, I think then it starts becoming, you know, a uh, more substantial player. But otherwise, I think, you know, in general, it's kind of interesting that there's a lot of materials that if you shine light on them, boom, they will generate power. So it's really a matter of like selecting which ones are the, um, you know, will generate the most amount of power. And so efficiency there plays a, you know, role. I am, of course, an efficiency person, you know, having worked at SunPower and now working at Alta Devices. And, you know, I, I, I have more of an efficiency bias towards the industry. I mean, everybody knows it's better, but some people feel that um, there's other ways of reducing cost. So certainly having OPV is, um, you start off with very cheap material, so that's a plus point. Um, the efficiency part is the challenge. Oh, and also one other thing, I think low light is actually quite good with OPV, so that's, will play a role. Yeah. Have you guys like, taken into consideration about temperature changes, so outside of California right. where it's sunny, but where you might have like right. 100 degrees for a high and then negative five for degrees for a high, and you have hail and other things? Yeah, excellent question. And actually, you know, a lot of, um, of uh, what is talked about is dollars per watt, but really what should be talked about is dollar, dollars per kilowatt hour produced. And that's where temperature and, you know, you're integrating over, your, over the whole year and location comes into play a lot more. Otherwise, most of these things that people actually quote are under standard testing conditions, which basically don't occur in the real world. So, so the industry is getting smarter and smarter about, um, you know, uh, comparing these. Um, fundamentally, the um, crystal and silicon has a worse temperature coefficient. So if you are on a hot roof and you're, I say, 20% panel, you will not generate as much power as if you were a thin film panel at the same efficiencies. So the technology, and so all thin film has better temperature coefficients. So the, the drop in, everybody is worse at higher temperatures because you're, you know, the, the mobility of your, um, um, of your electrons is not as good as if it's cooler, but some materials suffer more than others. So thin film, um, there's less of a drop in efficiency as temperature increases. Um, uh, you, again, gallium arsenide turns out has a much better temperature coefficient than silicon, so we also are better at higher temperatures than if you compare with, um, with crystal and silicon. Events like storms, hail, or blizzards. Right. So, um, so you know, qualification and certification is a big deal in this industry. Reliability, um, because it is you know used in building materials, um, and um, and so there is a uh, certification that involves fire and hail and 
um, moisture, all of that that people have to pass. Um, and in order to get the qualification to have a 25 year warranty, et cetera. And that's again because they're mostly used in you know building type applications, unlike what we what I was talking about with um, these you know more emerging markets. Um, and the um, the there is established tests um, for those um, that and you know the panels have actually been around for several decades, and so people recognize that the the if the materials you of construction that you use are are um, appropriate you won't have warranty problems most of it actually comes from the glass and the aluminum frames so glass is a material that's already proven to being um, you know resilient to nature um, and or to the um, to the elements and so that's one of the reasons glass is used it's also cheap Um, what's the price comparison per kilowatt hour for gallium arsenide versus silicon? And also, what is sort of the capacity, like the maximum capacity you can produce <laughs> at? Um, like, how rare are gallium and arsenide compared to silicon, which is right, really right. abundant? Um, so, definitely, silicon is much more um, you know, readily available um, on planet Earth. Um, but gallium is actually a byproduct of aluminum mining. And so, it's also, you know, there, there's um, a lot of gallium that's produced. Um, and when we do our calculations for how many, you know, gigawatts and terawatts we would produce until we start affecting global supply, it's a lot. We get into the terawatt region, but that's partially because we're only using a micron of the material. We're not actually using full wafers. And, um, and so um, supply is not something that's a problem. And actually it turns out, you know, cell phones, uh, your lasers, all of these have gallium arsenide. So from a... Um, you know, a material toxicity perspective also, it's already, um, you know, in many of the commercial devices that people use already. Um, so, you know, or it, it sounds a little bit more, you know, um, uh, toxic, but it really is not. As long as it's maintained together in a crystalline form. So what about prices? Prices. Um, so, the, um, as I mentioned, gallium comes out of aluminum mining, which is pretty cheap. Um, when we look at our overall cost of manufacturing, we can reach the same 50 cents a watt type targets that um, silicon can reach, but it would be at scale. Um, and the driver for that is more really the equipment scaling rather than the materials. So um, there's already been a benefit that, um, you know, the LED market has grown substantially over the last um, few years as well, right? So that has actually you know, there's been more um, gallium mining um, that has um, occurred because of that. And so there's already an industry that supports um, larger volume of production of the base materials. Yes? Um, you mentioned some, uh, the importance of manufacturing and the equipment. So do you know if, uh, what are the active research or development that are happening in this aspect, like in manufacturing and equipment for solar cells? Okay, so like the companies or the type of technologies? I guess general. So. General? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, kind of a, a uh, you know, one example would be that um, the, the, there's a wet edge process that you have to do um, in order to texture the surface of the crystal and silicon um, solar cells. And, um, uh, and, you know, there's a company um, in the Black Forest in Germany that um, makes this tool. In fact, I, maybe I can tell you a little bit about um, uh, what their story has been. So, um, you know, this was the the um, the German woodworking industry um, in the Black Forest um, was was well known for the tools that they used f to do the woodwork. Okay, though as time went on, those companies that would make the tooling started making tooling for the PCB industry and for the semiconductor industry. So they were Tool, they were equipment makers or tool makers, and but they kind of, you know, as the as industrialization changed to different industries, they actually followed that. But they were smaller scale, right? And so when solar kind of came up, um, people looked around and said, "Hey, okay, wh who will potentially do this kind of strange, slightly custom thing that I need to have done?" And these companies, you know, popped up, and so we, you know, go to them and say, "Hey, can you change this, you know, wet edge tool to do this and this?" And you know they're very capable equipment manufacturers, and so they would do this. So this is not applied materials and lamb and you know tell and 
all these established semiconductor equipment makers. They're basically small town, you know, um, equipment suppliers, but they're willing to do something that's different and custom and takes more technology. Um, so then, then the industry started booming and they said, oh, can we make two? And they're like, okay, we can make two. And then like, can you make 10? And then can you make 100? And so they were like, well, my goodness. So those, if you look at those companies, while the boom has happened, well, well you hear a lot about the Chinese um, solar manufacturers. There's another side parallel story for the equipment manufacturers in Asia that have, you know, gone from small, like literally a farmer founded this company and to now they're like the major suppliers with half a billion dollar of revenue as they're selling these equipment into China and around the world. But um, so, so what some of the, the things that they've done is that they used to make smaller tools that would have maybe four lanes of wafers um, etching at the same time. And they said, hey, we can actually get rollers to have this be um, 10 lanes at the same time. Now, you know, it's harder to keep the wafers in line as you, they have to go through this entire, you know, long etch process. But with the appropriate technology, with the appropriate machining, with the precision, with, you know, knowing the right coatings to put onto your gears to make sure that they last long, et cetera, et cetera, all those things have led to innovation that now they have, like, amazing yield because you can break silicon wafers very easily. There's only, they're only 200 microns or less thick. Um, so they, they, you know, you can transport them along... Um, this uh, this wet edge tool, and and you know 99.99 percent of the wafers come out um, with um, with the high um, you know passing the process, and previously that would be much less. So that's an example of kind of where um, innovation and technology has played an important role for the industry. So actually, there was um, if you kind of follow the equipment story. Um, applied Materials did actually get into um, the solar equipment manufacturing, and they came in from the thin film angle because they, they were depositing thin films anyway. So they thought, oh, well, I've got some big equipment that, de that deposits um, thin film for my flat panel display uh, tools. Why don't I use those same tools for the solar industry? So, so that's good, and they you know, it worked for a while, but the challenge is that the solar price point for your end product is much lower than it is for semiconductors or for flat panels. And so your equipment needs to also um, be, you know, simplified and the manufacturing and, uh, has to be consistent with those costs. So the solar manufacturers for equipment don't actually make the same amount of profits that, that standard semiconductor guys do, but they make it up in volume. Okay, good, all right. Well, thank you very much. I think we're right on yeah. time here, yeah? Okay.